Good afternoon and welcome to today's energy seminar. I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Paul McIntyre sitting right up in front here today. He will introduce uh, today's excellent speaker, speaking of computer science and uh, AI. Uh, uh, Pro Professor McIntyre is the director of the Synchrotron Radiation Laboratory at SLAC, a senior fellow in the Precord Institute for Energy and a faculty member in and former chairman of the Department of Material Science and Engineering here at Stanford. Paul, take it away. Thank you, John. <laughs> My great pleasure to introduce uh, Sadash Shankar today. Uh, Sadas is a uh, uh, distinguished uh, researcher in uh, microelectronics and uh, in and uh, currently holds uh, several different uh, in, holds down several different jobs uh, here at Stanford and at SLAC. He's a research te technical manager at SLAC, uh, responsible for an important research pro uh, uh, program in uh, benchmarking the internet efficiency of different uh, computing. Uh, approaches and technologies. Uh, he's also a uh, an adjunct professor in material science and engineering uh, at Stanford and a lecturer in the um, Graduate School of Business here at Stanford. And um, he, uh, uh, I came to know Sadas. I've known him for over twenty years. I came to know him um, when he led a, a very uh, significant <coughs> team at Intel. Um, uh, that basically did um, materials and process design for their entire uh, manufacturing, uh, global manufacturing operation, uh, and, uh, and really looked at the, the problems emerging uh, with scaling of semiconductor devices and how to address those. Uh, so he has a great deal of experience, both from an industrial point of view and an academic point of view, uh, in addressing issues like the ones he's, the one he's going to talk about today, which is uh, basically the sustainability or the energy uh, crisis, really, in, in computing. So please, Sadas. Thank you, Paul. Uh, thank you all for coming. So glad to be here and appreciate the opportunity to present. So I, I would like to start by thanking the people because I'm going to run out of time in the end. So I thought it's better to spend the first minute because there is a lot of funding, including from the Department of Energy. And this work was started when I was at Harvard uh, over five years back. And so the Hearst Foundation that funded my fellowship there and then the Slack institutional support, quite a few people helping with a lot of proposals that we submit. And then uh, the list of collaborators and a lot of people who have been encouraging me to pursue this part of computing, looking at it from energy perspective, which is a little bit different than what you would hear. You would generally hear computing from, from application perspective, but this is looking at it from energy perspective. So I'd like to thank all the people for helping out, including people uh, from Slack who make it all possible. So the premise of this talk is going to be twofold that a computing is essentially consists of processing information because of the wider audience, I thought I will just help set up and then I will ramp up into the areas that we are talking about. So if there are two states, computing essentially is switching between two states. That's a bit, that is a basic unit of computing. So there are two states and computing is physical when you actually have a computer. So in other words, it's for applying to realistic systems and it needs energy. Anything real in this world needs energy. So energy is the currency that everybody, everything, even from single cell being to inorganic materials need energy for their stability. So the second premise of this talk is heat, energy and heat. So if you think of a heat engine, heat comes in as a source of energy and then it does mechanical work and some heat. All biochemical life also is, a, is an energy engine. It takes chemical energy and converts it into mechanical work, heat energy, chemical energy, and does process information. So if you put these two together, computing essentially is an information processing engine it takes electromagnetic energy and 
changes it into information and then heat energy. So that's, that is the basic premise. With that said, we are going to look at this talk totally from an energy perspective. And you will see that it looks very different. Computers look very different from energy perspective and it's even agnostic to the different levels of computing, that's one. We will be crossing across several, several physics and chemi chemistry and biology, information processing and complexity as we walk through this talk. If I did my job right, or if I do my job right, you will not know that we are crossing areas. But at the end, you will see computing a little bit differently and why we need to think of it into the future a little differently. So computing examples is, now computing is everywhere around us. I just listed some examples. Artificial intelligence is being used everywhere for pattern recognition. Electric vehicles are called computers on wheels, at least at level four. Smart grids are called internet of energy. And uh, robotics are digital computers on legs and intelligent sensors are computing at the edge and data centers are large scale hubs of computation. So everything, the, our world has evolved into everything around computing. So the talk will have four parts and after each of these sections, I will have a summary. So because of the topics we cover, we'll start with the trends and why they are unsustainable. I'll try to make a case for it and we will go a little bit deeper into what are the underlying causes and then the potential paths forward and then we will end with what is artificial general intelligence. You, you keep hearing that we are very close to AGI, it's thousands of days, a few years out. So I will kind of recast the entire AGI in terms of physics and chemistry and you can take a look at it and be a judge. I will give you my my judgment or my, my conclusion on that. So let's start with the unsustainable trends. It's official. This is essentially taken. Uh, I have the references. 2023 was the world's warmest year on record. 46 years since the earth had a cooler than average year. So it's not just that it's hot. The trend is also getting hotter and hotter and hotter. Three this is taken from different news pieces. Three Bay Area cities had the hottest summer in history as the climate change pushes up. We know this. It's not just Bay Area. Phoenix sees hottest September on record as heat wave persists over 100 degree Fahrenheit. So it just essentially, there is, the climate is changing. The United States, this is just taken this year has just witnessed its most extreme October heat. We just passed October. October was a very hot October last month. Millions of Americans have never seen this hot in October before as a hit, historic wave hits. So the problem of heat is very high. Now, this is, what, what has this got to do with computing? So I, I'm going to start to show you the connection. This is taken from BBC. London actually went offline last year and the year before during summer and the Google's data centers had to be shut down and the doctors had to write those on tablets, pencil and paper. They couldn't use the computing to enter a lot of the things because of the heat. The electricity had to be shut off uh, because they wanted to conserve it. This is taken from the Financial Times. It's again hot. So th that's just one, one message. Now let's look at where computing is and I'm going to show you about crypto coin mining. I think many of you would have heard of crypto coin mining. Um, so this is essentially the data centers used for crypto coin mining. You can see that this is in Rockdale, Texas and 38% of the crypto coin mining in the world is done in the US because the US has cheaper electricity available and data centers. So even people not living in this country are doing the crypto coin mining because we are able to host them. This is it, it again in Nebraska, where the computers in this building use about as much electricity as 73,000 homes around them. 
So you can see the, the problem. Now I'm going to show you the artificial intelligence and why it, is, it has catalyzed this explosive growth. This is a plot through the last decade, 2010 through about 2020. The y-axis is the number of floating point operations, the blue one. The last 10 years has been the advent of AI application. So you can actually see that the number of applications are starting, this is a logarithmic y-axis, by the way. And what is more, as scientists, the number of operations, floating point operations per parameter is of the order of trillion type operations are needed for a single parameter fitting. So this is a huge use of computing in terms of that exponential increase. This is the energy estimated for AI training taken from data uh, published. The blue is essentially the chat GPT training data, low and high bounds. The orange is inference, where it is being run round the clock. So people say training takes time, but inference doesn't. But inference is run round the clock, while training is done for dedicated time. Compared to an electricity consumption in a, in a household per year. And this is the energy spent in a human during an entire lifetime. Again, the y-axis is in kilowatt hour and logarithmic, okay? So each unit is a thousand. So you can see how much a human is spending energy in as opposed to chat GPT for training. It's, it's not just chat GPT as you will see. It has 175 billion parameters, but so you need to first train it and then use it. So it takes time <laughs> whether to store it or not. And these are the new AI chip examples. A lot of chip designs are coming on the market, over 21 of them from different startups. They're all joining this, uh, this rat race on AI, okay? Now, the energy, I, I, I decided to show it graphic, decided to show it pictorially rather than graphically. The transistor, is the basic unit of computation. The transistor is put in a computer, and then you actually simulate the system. Those are the levels, roughly. The energy from the transistor is done about 10, the energy used from the transistor is about 10 to the power minus 18 joules per bit. That's attojoule, okay? By the time it goes to system, you are essentially six, to nine orders of magnitude higher for a system level computation. By the time you do a simulation, it's another nine to 15 orders of magnitude higher. This is published, but I just wanted to show you the picture first and I will show you the graph. This is the same thing, which I said in words is shown in graph. This is the green one is what the ATP, ADP conversion in our cell is happening. The purple is the thermodynamic limit. Then you are actually going through, this is the transistor. You are going through system, four bit, eight bit, the way you compute. Then you essentially get to simulations. This is a scientific high performance simulation. This is crypto coin mining. This is natural language processing, large language model training. So you can see how the energy goes up. It's the same as before. Now I'm going to show you the top 500 supercomputers. These are number one and two supercomputers in the world. Frontier in Oak Ridge, it consumes about 21 megawatts of power. Aurora consumes about 60 megawatts of power, about two exaflops. So this, I mean, this is known to people and both of these are operated by the US Department of Energy. So this is the annual electricity used by some of the countries, not all of them. And the electricity usage correlate with the GDP of that country. So Afghanistan is on the left. You can see the next one is top 500 computers. It consumes more, just the 500 of them consume more electricity. And this is the total world usage of electricity. Now, if you take those two supercomputers I showed you and made all the 500 have this, use the same power as the second most, 
one exascale computer, then you will get that blue diagram, which means just 500 supercomputers will be consuming more electricity than Israel, Finland, Switzerland. If they all become the biggest machine, then they will consume more than the continent of Australia. There are only two countries that can host 500 supercomputers, that is the US and China, because the rest of the countries don't have that kind of an electricity uh, provision. So 25% of the top 500 are installed in US. So this essentially need to divide by four just to look at how much US is spending. But this was just more of a, to illustrate that. Now the next, right now we have exascale. Japan has started developing zeta flop scale computing. They expect it to be there in 2025. And this is essentially taken. I will not go over it, but I just want to make sure that you see the numbers estimated. It would need, one computer would need 21 nuclear power plants just for one computer, okay? Zeta scale computer. I don't know whether Japan can actually run them. It has to be run with this much of energy available. And this is essentially showing how the efficiency has been improving. People claim it has been made efficient, but the numbers look very daunting. Now, in order to achieve zeta scale computing, even with the best case scenario, where the energy is driven in terms of gigaflops per watt, you don't need to worry about the details of the numbers, but the number, you, it needs lot of stars to line up for the zeta scale computer to happen. And people have started working on it. That's all this is to show. Now I'm going to show you data centers. Um, so all over the world, data centers are the hubs which host enormous computing. Everything on the cloud that we are looking at the phone are hosted on the data centers. World over in 2020, Four, there are 10,000 data centers, about 52% are in the United States. So US carries a disproportionate amount of the data centers in terms of hosting them. Followed by Germany, UK, and then China. Okay. Now, if you put back the data centers, these data centers, they consume more than the 500 supercomputers I showed you. They consume more than the United Kingdom more electricity per year than Indonesia and Mexico, okay? Just these data centers that exist today, not tomorrow's today. And if you put them state-wise and compare the electricity used by 50 states, the data centers other than Texas, they consume more electricity than all the 49 states of the continental US. So. And even if you give divided by 50%, saying that only 50% of them are in the United States, they consume more electricity than all but five states. So it's like the sixth state. That's how much electricity is being consumed by the data centers. Now, you would think, oh, energy is the problem. We will get, we have infinite source of energy from the sun, almost. That's the argument you hear. But there are other issues with data centers. So this is the noise that creates around to people who are living around the data. From Indiana to Oregon, thousands of acres are being put to data centers in the name of the AI revolution that we are seeing. People who live near Northern Virginia Center have complained that this fans sound like a leaf blower that never goes away even in the night, even in the night. In fact, the residents of Virginia, in Virginia has the, by the way, the largest number of data centers, the state of Virginia. Some of them, I said, it sounds like an airplane engine, that this is the most interesting, it's a sad thing, but it's interesting, that an airline pilot prefers to be on the plane rather than stay in his home. He would rather be flying the plane because it's less noisy than the data center noise that is closer to his home. 
So this is actually because of the extreme noise. So people are actually struggling because of this. So this is actually, I taped this in a data center. There's somebody talking. I just wanted you to hear the noise yourself. Can you hear this? I'll try to play this again with the mic. Somebody is talking. I couldn't hear what he was saying. So this is how it's inside. It's like a deafening, a low frequency roar all the time. Okay. So anyway. So this is essentially taken from one of the health publications. And you can actually see that. Uh, Excuse me, where is the noise coming from? Is it from the cooling? The fans, the cooling fans. Okay. Yes. And, and, and I'll, I'll show you a little bit more about, but what is versus, this is essentially taken from a publication that, uh, it causes a lot of mental health. So kids have not been able to sleep. It has been affecting in Tennessee and some of the southern states. So this is a real problem. We are not seeing it, but this is a real problem that's happening elsewhere. So now people say, okay, let's bring sustainability into data centers. Let's try to get better energy source, sustainable energy source and see what it is. And I'm going to show you we have done the analysis for this. This is actually energy conversion percentage. Let me explain what it is. This is to convert energy from electricity to thermal. You can convert 100% of the energy. So if you are converting from electricity to thermal, you can convert it 100%. If you convert it from mechanical to electricity, you can convert it over 90%. So this is ranked from the most efficient form of energy transfer to the least efficient. And the least efficient I have marked in red are all thermal back to electric, thermal back to mechanical, or thermal to something else. So once the energy goes into thermal, it's very hard to extract. And what does computing do? Computing takes electricity, the most efficient form of storage, converts it into heat, at the speed of computing. So every bit of operation is converting it into heat. And once it's get converted to heat, it is subjected to the laws of thermodynamics. Your efficiency goes down. You cannot recover it once it's done. So that, that is essentially the energy conversion. So if you put these factors in, you can see that the data center, I showed you the data center energy usage, Actually, I call this the 3E effect. So for one unit of computing, you need energy, electricity to be sent in. All of that is converted to heat, so that's 2E. And then the extra electronics you need for running the fan and the, and the other things, so it's 3E. That was my estimate. So, so it should be three times the energy for one unit of compute. Then I actually did the numbers. So assuming different sources for energy from biomass, photovoltaic, hydro, geothermal, gas, coal, and nuclear, remember nuclear, you actually see it's five times the energy because of conversion inefficiencies, unless it's hydro. Hydro is the most efficient and that's five still because all the electricity delivered to the data center does not get converted in 100% into the energy. So what I thought was 3E ends up being 5E when you actually do the analysis. And now I, I cut the 3E and made it 5E. And I just want to show you how complicated the cooling circuits have become. This I, I actually took a picture in a data center. And you can see the cooling circuits are starting to look as complicated as the wiring for electricity because you just need to be able to cool them. So now let's look at the economics. 
and sustainable trends number six. This is actually a Stanford uh, report that is put out. Different AI models and the training cost. We are in 2024, okay? So this is outdated. To train, it needs anything between, you, 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 you pick your number from 78 million to $200 million approximately to train a model. That is the cost, okay? But it's actually even worse than this, this estimate. A models now cost one billion to train, and some of the new startup CEOs are saying only hundred million dollars is is a smaller AI. So we have totally reset our mentality, saying, "Oh, one billion you need just for training." I mean, forget the cost. And. Um, I have heard numbers as high as $150 billion you need in your pocket before you start a new AI company. I've heard from some of the people whom I wouldn't mention, but uh, some of the people to whom, you know, who have a lot of credibility in this area have been saying numbers like $150 billion north of it and so on. So now data centers, so this is taken from a different report that data centers could use 9% of the US electricity, which is a gigantic number. US consumes the maximum electricity in the world. And home building in West London have been halted in certain places because they just don't have enough electricity in the grid. And it's even worse in other countries. In Ireland, the power de demands increased 144% in five years. Amsterdam says no more new data centers, Netherlands, and 15% of the Danish electricity will be used by data centers. So it's not just the United States. It's a problem all over, and people just don't know how to address that. And so companies go and buy nuclear plants now. So this is essentially one of the companies which bought a nuclear plant. Assuming an 835 megawatt plan running at 96.3% capacity, they essentially need tax credit to be able to run this profitable thing for AI training. This is another company bought a nuclear powered data center that for $650 million, 10 year agreement to purchase powers. And as I showed you, nuclear to electricity conversion is not that high. You get at least so the numbers I showed you, it takes more than five times energy because of the conversion efficiencies. This is another nuclear powered plant. They wanted to buy 180 megawatts and now it generates 2.5 gigawatts and they think that they may need more of it. So now I showed you the energy and I'm showing you the economics that it's unsustainable trend the trend that is continuing is unsustainable. Now I'm going to show you the data requirements. This is how the GPT-3 parameters were trained according to this reference. I want you to know one thing, being scientists, a lot of the data for GPT is not coming from books and journals. It's a small number. It's coming from Wikipedia, Reddit link, web crawling, and other places. So that's what is used to train. Okay. Now, you may, you may have seen, we just went through an election where they kind of poll 5,000 people and say that they know the numbers of how, how, many, how people are inclining in that particular state. How did they get 5,000 people and why do we need so much data? That is a statistical problem, very, very specific to the kind of distributions that we are using it for. Most of the polling is done assuming normal distribution, a Gaussian distribution, so it has very tight bounds. But what is essentially the thing that AI is being trained is what is called Pareto distributions. So they have very long tails and they don't have a variance. So you need huge amounts of data. And that is why you need 175 billion parameters. And I'm going to show you about the English language. This is the distribution I drew 
on the English language. Uh, if you look colloquial, if you look at more classical English language, there are about 170,000 words. If you look at it in the colloquial language, including all the words that we have actually invented, there are 3 million words. And this is how the distribution is. It is because of these tail, you need a constant training of these machine learning models. They are not susceptible to just your statistical training that we are used to learning in statistics classes. And look at the number of floating point operations per second per parameter. You can see trillions of floating point operations are needed to train one. So the data requirements are, are essentially unsustainable. Now let's go to semiconductor manufacturing, which is closer to my area. So you can see that the energy for manufacturing, it, so we talked about the energy of computing. Now you need to manufacture the chip. That consumes electricity as much as whole uh, countries. So this is essentially taken from the code. You can see the same thing, vast amounts of energy used. And TSMC, which is the biggest foundry, does Taiwan have enough power for this? And this is actually a work done in collaboration uh, with the business school. Um, this is the industry-wide energy consumption in terawatt hours per year, and you can see it's increasing. It started increasing when the EUV essentially extreme ultraviolet started coming. So we have normalized it with respect to chip, but I just want to show you. So 44% growth over this period. And from 2019 onwards, the growth has turned upwards and roughly the energy consumption of Nigeria just for one factory. And this is essentially showing the sources of electricity used, and I'm going to dwell on it. Uh, TSMC used about 17,000 gigawatt hours. Uh, I showed it in terawatt hours. It's approximately the same. So the summary of the unsustainable trends part of my talk is energy and resource requirements are on a trajectory that appears unsustainable. It's due to energy, increasing miniaturization, and economics of scaling needs to commensurate with the end user application. Right now, it assumes we are going to use all the computing. But we haven't addressed the root causes or the larger effects. So we just need to understand what it is. So we are going to dig a little deeper into this. Let's start with manufacturing because I just spoke about it. So what lies beneath this? In semiconductor manufacturing, if you were to cut the electricity used by processing step, photolithography was the highest, followed by etching, then iron implantation, CMP. These are all processing steps. You don't need to worry about it. But lithography was energy intensive even before the new technology that came in that is called extreme ultraviolet. And I will show you why you need extreme ultraviolet. So this is essentially the wavelength of radiation in nanometers, and this is the energy. Right now, we are making chips smaller than 10 nanometers. So you need radiation to be at least commensurate with the dimension. And that essentially is what you are seeing here. And if you look at the electricity, just look at the two arrows that I have marked. Only 0.04% of the electricity is used for lithography, the inefficient transfer of energy through the EUV equipment, 0.04% if you calculate it from top down. I calculated it from bottom up using bond energy and 95% of the total electricity is essentially spent in, in lithography and that is the source for it. Now let's look at what is called a bit utilization. So this is looking at 10 years. 2010 through 2022 approximately. And this is essentially the energy of transistor. You can actually see that the energy of instructions are orders of magnitude higher as I showed you. So what this means is 
suboptimal use of transistors for instructions when you go to the system. So you can make the transistor efficient, but your system can still be inefficient. But after arguing that you cannot say, oh, I, then it doesn't matter what the transistor efficiency is, it does. Because if your underlying unit is not efficient, then everything you build on this will be even more inefficient. So it's not, you need that efficiency as a necessary, necessary item, but not sufficient. You need more on top of it. And why is that? So this is essentially energy in joules. So this is transistor here. As you go to memory, DRAM, then you go into floating point operations, on-chip communication, off-chip communication. You can see that the energy in y-axis keeps going up. By the time you end up at the top for wireless data transfer, you're 15 orders of magnitude higher. That is where the energy goes. So transistor is very efficient. Then you need to essentially have your instruction. Then you need to communicate that to memory, and then you need to store it and bring it back. And then by the time we get to use information, it has become highly inefficient. So this essentially shows you where the efficiency is, more like an auditing of this. So I, I'm just showing the same diagram of where it came from, just to reinforce the point. So now, people have argued that I will use more efficient algorithms. Can we use very efficient algorithms and do that? And I'm going to show you that that, that doesn't solve the problem. So take this to be number of entities you are simulating or computing. It starts with 10,000. It's log, 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 log plot. So each unit is 10 to the power 4. Y-axis is the number of computations needed. Okay. Now, I'm going to grid it. And this is where exascale computing is. That's where we are. Okay. From petascale to exascale, you can't see it because of the light reflection. Sorry about that. It took 14 years to go from petascale to exascale. So these units which I am showing are the things that we are simulating. And I'm going to show you what they are. This is essentially the action potentials in a neuron, or number of cells in a human, or number of four junction devices from 70 elements in periodic table, number of reactions, number of molecules in a mole, total number of reactions in a human in a lifetime, and the number of possible organic molecules. So if you are simulating, you need these kind of, just some sort of benchmark that you need to be able to satisfy. So these are what are called linear algorithms and log algorithms. They are sort. If you are doing sorting on your, uh, if you are doing search on your computer, that is linear. Okay. Logarithm is a combination with a linear, but this is how linear. So if you use a linear algorithm, this is all you can simulate today. So exascale here, that's all we have. And where it meets this curve, you drop vertically. So you can simulate these three systems. Does it make sense what I'm saying? Because that's all the computing power you have for linear. But none of the things we do in materials or chemistry are linear. They are what are called polynomial scaling algorithms. This is how they are. So this is n squared density functional theory, any computations are essentially much higher than that. Many body strong correlations. Then your square has gotten very small. You can only simulate up to this because that's all the computing you have. But more complicated are protein folding and more complex combinatorial problems. They are called NP, NP algorithms. <clears throat> They are even steeper, which means this is all you can simulate. So the argument I am making is even if you used computing, even if you continued on the current trajectory, you are still not able to solve the problem. So summarizing this, energy and resource requirements on a trajectory that appear unsustainable, but digging deep, we have found out that inefficient bit utilization complexity of applications and complexity of algorithms. I didn't go into this. 
and then solving there is a slowing of geometry based scaling called Moore's law and that is actually making the problem a little worse. So now paths forward. So one of the things uh, I showed you this, I am showing it again that there is this much of headroom for energy efficiency. So what we have identified are there are four different domains in computing, microelectronic system, which is currently evolving, nature inspired in green, quantum inspired in, in turquoise or blue, and then algorithms and software. So if you divide computing into these four domains, you can estimate the energy headroom you have maximum in this. So essentially in the algorithms, you can reduce energy by up to 10 billion compared to thermodynamic limit. They're all normalized to thermodynamic limit at the center. Quantum information, you can go from 10,000 to 10 million. And nature inspired, you can go from one to 100 million. And even in the hardware architecture devices, you can go up to 100 million. We're running short on time. Oh, okay. So uh, one of the efforts we have done is energy efficient computing with US Department of Energy. So about 63 uh, entities have signed this pledge. I just want to show it. And they have released an RFI based on the analysis I'm showing. So I can stop it here. We are doing more. There are, I, I didn't want to kind of spoil the fun of talking about AGI. So I think I should end with that. I will skip this part and then end with AGI if I can have your indulgence for a few more minutes. Sounds good, sounds good. Okay. So we are, we are actually in the process of discussions with many people to set up a testing center in between Slack and Stanford. I just will go over that. A lot of interesting stuff we are doing. And one of the things I want to say is the formalism we are doing can generate a periodic table of computing. So different things can be put on based on energy and complexity, and we are working in mapping this out. I just wanted to show that. Now I'm going to go to artificial intelligence. Uh, does everybody know what AGI is? You, you keep hearing it. I mean, how many people know what it is? I can speed up or I can kind of just set it up depending on what I see. Just a show of hands, how many know what AGI is very well? Okay. They know. <laughs> so I think I should talk about it because, okay. So this is the definition of AGI. It was essentially defined in 2005. It's AI systems that possess reasonable degree of self-understanding and autonomous self-control. We are living in Silicon Valley, so people keep telling us that we are very close to AGI. It could be any time now because there is, there is a breakthrough and I want to show you what that means. So in order to understand AGI, this is definition from IBM, definition from others, but I'm not going to go through this. You have heard imitation game, right, about the Alan Turing. So I'm going to explain that a little bit because everything is based on understanding AGI and imitation game. So this was originally proposed by Alan Turing in 1950, where he said that if a comp if there's somebody on the other side of a mirror or a wall and you give them instructions and some instructions are done and if you cannot tell whether it was done by a machine or a human and if you do it more than a certain percentage then you have you have artificial intelligence you have real intelligence because then the computer is able to trick you into thinking it's a human that's what he said okay so this was his thing, and it, he said in 50 years of time, it will be possible. And this is the basis of the movie Imitation Game that if you have seen it. So I want to put it in picture. So this is an interrogation plane, and this is an imitation mirror. Here is artificial intelligence, and this is natural intelligence, C and N. So you, you ask the question, and it essentially answers. So 
the, the system should pass Turing's test. So what I am proposing is we should essentially expand it and I'm going to show you how. So Turing's test that I showed you need to be physically embodied in a system. The minute you talk about physical embodiment, you need to talk about energy, you need to talk about time, you need to talk about everything else. So the argument I'm making, and I'll show you this, information, energy, and time in the computing system should be less than or equal to time of the natural intelligence. If it does that, then you have essentially gotten an AGI. And I'm going to show you that we are not there and why we are not there. So there are seven levels. I'm going to show you just three levels and quickly go through it. First level is information. You give a specific task across the wall and the machine needs to do it. So this is a computer on the right hand side. This is a human. The transistor frequency is about a gigahertz. The number of chemical reactions in a cell, in a single cell you have is of the order of a billion per second. If you count the number of reactions in a human body, it's about 10 to the power 21. And this is the number of floating point operations on an exascale computer. Now, level two time, time for the task to be completed. So if we get infected by COVID, it takes up to two to 14 days for the body to experience that it has gotten sick. It essentially senses sickness at that time, even though cells have done that. The same virion, when it was simulated on a machine, it took about 8.77 days. So time is faster in terms of a computing. So just bear with me, I'm going to close this quickly. Now let's look at the energy. Level three, humans consume 110 watts, brain 14 watts, and the energy per synapses is, is in terms of attojoules. These exascale computer takes 60 megawatts, okay? Here we are talking about picowatts. Keep that in mind. And then I also want to show you, this is taken about 3000 species in nature their weight and metabolism plotted. And we are going to put the microprocessor and the supercomputer on this. I had to actually increase the scale. So if you look at it from an evolutionary perspective, computers are very fragile systems because evolution will only approve things on this graph, not on a new graph, unless you su supply it with a lot of energy. So if I put it all together, I did, I skipped through a lot of it because of time. This is human made, this is nature. So if you look at level one information, we are very close to it. That's what the people here are arguing for AGI. And time computers are faster, but all the other levels we will fail. So AGI, if you really go by what Turing was trying to say, if you actually do a physical embodiment of it, it needs to pass all the seven levels. And just to show you the data, people tried to do a cellular Turing test that they took a cell, a man-made synthetic cell and a real cell, and they tried to see whether the real cell will believe that the synthetic cell is a real cell called a cellular Turing test. And guess what happened? They found out that only 39% of the time that the cell believed it was a real cell. So remaining 61%, even a cell didn't believe that the synthetic cell was real. Leave alone humans believing it, right? So with that, I will conclude. So assessment of proximity to AGI is, I, I really think that the current paths are not real AGI. It's information-centric AGI. So computing needs to be at least energy efficient and then all the other things which I showed you. So with that, I will conclude the talk.